Hello, and thank you so much for tuning in to today's very important video. I call it very important because a lot of the times when psychopaths run cults, they find a way to make themselves appear endearing to the general public. I remember in some of the documentaries about the fall of Nexium and the subsequent trial and conviction of Keith Raniere, it was brought up that in the early days of his pyramid schemes, people sympathized with him. He kind of portrayed himself to be sort of a nerd, sort of like a, an innocent, innocuous little guy who had some interesting ideas. And because he acted humble, people were more vulnerable towards his predation. We often don't suspect evil to come in a pretty package or to come in the form of humility. And I really feel like a lot of the narcissistic, malignant psychopaths who start cults are aware of that. They systematically study human behavior and human response and craft their personas in such a way that people will trust them. And that's how the beginning of the enslavement of a person's consciousness begins. If you haven't already seen it, Vikram Gandhi, the renowned American director, made a really cool social experiment come documentary called Kumare, in which he dresses up as a guru and gets a lot of followers and makes them very devoted to him. And I saw this documentary really shortly after I escaped the cult of Nityananda. And I noticed in one of the scenes, there's a poster in the background of the fraud guru I once followed with his hands folded really humbly, bowing his head, and it's captioned with a quote, I am not here to tell you I am God. I am here to tell you, you are God. And back in 2009, when I first got caught up in the cult, recruited into it, when the brainwashing process began, that's the sort of false humility the man who now sits on a golden throne draped in pounds of golden jewelry, declaring himself to be the world's most powerful Purnavatar or incarnation of all the gods, he once acted really sweet and really innocent. And before I get into the juice of today's video, debunking the five states of sannyas to which he claimed to embody, I want to share how when we get lured in by somebody who seems really innocent, we fall in love with the idea they portrayed themselves to be so that as their narcissistic traits come up, as they start to become arrogant and manipulative and vengeful and angry, we push past those red flags because we want to maintain our initial reaction. We want to believe in that fairy tale. A lot of victims of domestic violence will not leave their abusive partners. And this is the reason they'll say, but he loves me, but I know there was something real between us. And this is what a lot of disciples of fraud gurus feel as well. No matter how bullied and antagonized and abused and manipulated and forced to do things they don't enjoy, they may be, they remember the honeymoon phase they had with their so-called guru, and they'll use that to justify the evil that comes in later on once the guru has caught them or feels like they've become devoted and subservient. So with that kind of explained, you know, he began his mission by saying, I'm not here to tell you I'm God, I'm here to tell you you're God. But later he rephrased it and said, the one who shows you you are God is Guru. And the Guru is closer to you than the higher God to whose relationship you aspire. And don't bow to God first, bow to the guru first, because the guru, without the guru, even though you were God, you would never have realized you were God. And so all these 
amendments come in later. Like the initial jargon is really catchy. He's here to show you your higher possibility, your higher potential. But when you feel a sense of gratitude for that, or you feel like that's a beautiful gift he's given, he then makes you feel indebted towards him. And that's like the beginning of the downfall into whatever agenda he actually has. You know, anybody who sets themselves up on a pedestal and imposes themselves as an authority in your life, they have an agenda. And it's important to know what that is. So what is the agenda of the fraud who calls himself Nityananda? He wants money, he wants fame, he wants sex, and that's it. He doesn't care about anybody else but himself. He doesn't see people as deserving of respect. Another, another irony here is that he used to start all of his discourses with folded hands saying, I welcome you all with my love and respect. He doesn't love or respect anybody. He just knows people appreciate hearing those words. It's a script he has created. Anyway, I have a long laundry list of topics I want to cover about this fraud, including going through Dr. Stephen Hayson's bite model, including the comparison between the criminal convictions of Keith Raniere, such as racketeering and human trafficking and forced labor, and showing how Nityananda is doing the same things, including child pornography and such. But I thought I would start with this topic because of a comment that appeared on my last video where I talk about cult red flags that was left by Louis Mendoza. So I'm going to read Louis's comment first and then explain why it's irrelevant. So Louis, I hope you are watching this. I hope you understand this. I hope if you are brainwashed by Nityananda, you'll get some professional help or do some proper research. Look into the materials regarding Nexium and see the parallels. Don't just blindly believe what the so-called Sangha tells you because they have been trained to make whistleblowers seem crazy to use something Scientology calls fair game, where they attack their attackers or bounce the accusations back on the accuser. It's a lot of confusion that they create in people who are seekers, who come to them with a sense of spiritual aspiration. And by the nature of your comment, I have a feeling that they are really trying to hold you in their trap. But if you are looking at my videos and listening to this, that's a good sign. There's some hope that you can come out of this. So I'm sorry to put you on the spot here, but you left it as a public comment and I feel it deserves a public response. So what Louis wrote was, everyone here, if you don't want to be with Nityananda, just don't be with him. Don't you have a right to love and be with whoever you want? He's not forcing anyone to listen to him. This lady is just talking hate and hate and hate to someone who just talks about the scriptures and wears Rudraksha. Why don't you talk about Putin or cartel killers in Mexico, people who chop and torture girls? Why so much hate against the Hindu sannyasi? If you want to do your own spiritual work, go ahead, but hating someone so much and all your hate speech is not spiritual at all. Anyone who hates is not spiritual. So I kind of want to do a point by point response to this. First, you know, Nityananda is not really a sannyasi. That's the main point of this video. I'll get into it as we go on. Before I get into that, why don't I talk about Putin or cartel killers in Mexico? I have no personal experience serving Putin, and I have never been a part of a cartel in Mexico. And while I do agree that the atrocities these monsters are committing deserve to be addressed, deserve to be exposed, and should be stopped. It's not my place to blow the whistle on an organization to which I was never a part, because I was personally with the fraud who calls himself Nityananda, because the kids who were tortured by him cried to me, and I took that as a cry for help. I'm doing something about this because this is something I can do something about. So 
that's why I don't dedicate my channel to Putin or to Mexican cartels because I'm not an expert in either of those. I am an expert in Nityananda. So thanks for the suggestion, but I'll stick to the monster I personally experienced. Now, you mentioned that Putin and the cartels torture and chop girls. So does Nityananda. And if you don't know already, there was a young girl, 24 years old, named Sangita, who mysteriously died under Nityananda's care. She had been initiated into his organization. She wanted out. She complained to her family that she was being abused in the Nityananda cult. The cult called her back to drop her kavi or to renounce her initiation formally. And while she was there to renounce her initiation, she died. The cult told all of its followers that there was a history of heart disease in her family, that her father had died of a heart attack, and so this wasn't anything suspicious, that she just died of a heart attack. However, her mother has since gone public and has also tried to take the issue to court to get some justice in her, her daughter's murder, and has come on record as saying there was no history of heart disease in the family, Sangeeta's father did not actually die of a heart attack, and that in fact her daughter had told her she had been beaten by the cult. Now, no formal autopsy was ever conducted by the family's request because Nityananda arranged for Sangeeta to be cremated before her family could even see the body of their daughter or say goodbye properly. Now, if that is not akin to what you described, then I don't know what is. And it's really messed up that people ignore all of the victims from the past who tried to speak out because their voices deserve to be heard. I would sooner sympathize with a grieving mother than with the man who did away with any evidence as to the actual death of her daughter. So really, please don't try to paint Nityananda as less evil than Putin or than cartels because he's running his own cartel complete with human trafficking that I may get into in a video pretty soon. Um, but in the meantime, you say, why so much hate against the Hindu sannyasi? I do not hate any genuine Hindu sannyasis. Anybody who chooses to live a life of dharma, to me, deserves respect and admiration. I was sucked into that cult because of my love for Sanatana Dharma. I have a high regard for anyone who commits their life to a spiritual purpose. This is what made me vulnerable to Nityananda. This is what made me a prime target for his cult manipulation and brainwashing. I fell for him because I love sannyasis. I'm not an anti-Hindu. I'm not against somebody who is truly humble. I am somebody who is mad that my devotion was preyed upon and taken advantage of by a fraud. So when you go into the Nityananda cult, the fraud guru describes five key qualifications for a sannyasi. For those of you who don't know the term, the technical term sannyasi refers to a monastic Hindu, Hindu who is like a seeker, a wanderer, who has given up the luxuries of the material world in order to strive for a higher purpose, to strive for enlightenment. Those qualities, I've written the list so I don't forget, are Satya, Aparigraha, Asteya, Ahimsa, and Brahmacharya. Sorry for all the Sanskrit if you're not familiar with it. I will give you the translations. Let's start with Satya, truth. A true sannyasi is somebody who does not lie because they have nothing to prove to anybody. Truth as it is, is a sign of the integrity of someone living a Vedic path. Satya is considered one of the prerequisites for the path of yoga as described by Patanjali. It's one of the eight qualifications for Ashtanga yoga. And it's a very beautiful thing. When a person is in a space beyond lying, we inherently have a reason to trust them. We know that they are not 
using their words as a trap, we know that they're being straightforward. Now, Nityananda claims to be a sannyasi, but he was not living satya. He was not honest. He was not true. And I'm not saying this as in, well, you can bend and skew what he said to make it mean something else. Like, no, I mean, literally, he was a liar. For example, and I'll give you a few examples for each of these points. Back in 2015 in Thailand, he held a program and the day before the participants saw him for the first time on stage, he spent the entire night having a local Thai lady do his hair into dreadlocks. And I witnessed this with my own eyes. I had to do like the emceeing for the event. So I had to be the one on stage for day one, introducing the program, introducing participants to the processes they were going to go through, the completion, the so-called completion, the so-called Shakti manifestation. I had to talk about Niti, as we now call Nityananda. I had to boast and brag and just prepare them for the glory that he was to present himself as. So the night before the program started, he called me to his bedroom because he wanted me to run through what I had planned to say on stage. And like I said, I got to his room and there he was with a local lady dividing up his hair and crocheting it into dreadlocks. And all of the higher people close to him in his cult, all the Sri Mahants, were sitting in his room with piles of hair extensions making those into the dread extensions that would be attached once his hair had been crocheted. And I got really excited because I love the look of dreadlocks. I think they're really cool. And as a Shaivite Hindu, I understood the significance of jatas, of Shiva jatas. So I excitedly said like, wow, you're getting your hair made into jatas. You're getting Shiva jatas. And he kind of laughed and he said, yes, ma but don't tell anybody that these were done. If anybody asks, they just appeared on my head. And I mean, if you see, I think it was Drida, the blissful athlete, as he calls himself, somebody had flat out asked him under one of his video, is it true that these hair extensions just appeared on your guru's head? And he said, yes, they did. But everyone there knows, in fact, no, they didn't. And that was one of the first times I realized Nityananda was flat out lying. I knew that what he said was completely false. And it did make me pause to wonder, if this is a lie, what else is a lie? So that's just one example. And this is a fairly benign example. You know, nobody really gets hurt by somebody getting hair extensions and pretending that their hair is real. It's kind of like if a celebrity gets plastic surgery and then denies it. But you wouldn't expect somebody who claims to be a sannyasi, who claims to be living a life of satya, to lie about something so vain. But he wanted people to believe that he was a miracle worker and so this is how he would trick people. Another example of his lies, there was a day when he told me to make videos attacking Satguru Jagi Vasudev and Sri Sri Ravi Shankar, two other gurus in India who Nityananda considered his rivals or his competition. And he told me, for example, for Jagi Vasudev, he told me to go after him for a statement for a statement that he had made, Satguru had made, about Abhishekam, which is a, a worship ceremony in which Hindus pour various offerings onto a deity. And Jagi Vasudev had said something along the lines of, or at least Nityananda told me that he had said, you know, we pour these things on a Shiva Lingam so the stone doesn't crack. And Niti took great offense to that and told me to go after him and kind of school him about why we really offer these out of devotion. And he told me a few insults I should weave into this discourse that he told me to make. And I said, well, 
isn't it wrong for one guru to attack another guru? Like he used to say in his earlier days, friendliness is the space of Advaita. And, you know, Advaita means oneness. So be friendly with other people. Don't question another person's path. He would say it's violence to come between a, a guru and a disciple. So I said, you know, isn't this committing violence against Satguru's disciples to say something that might come between them with their guru? And without skipping a beat, the fraud who calls himself Nithyananda told me, don't worry, Ma. If you get criticized for this, if anybody says she's attacking Satguru, I'll come public and say, she did this without my permission. I'm so sorry she took it too far. Don't worry, I'll punish her for this and it will never happen again. And I was a little shell-shocked thinking, wait a minute, you're instructing me to attack Sri Sri Ravi Shankar. I don't even remember what he wanted me to say about Sri Sri anymore. But you're telling me to attack two other gurus. You're giving me a script. You're telling me which specific points to attack them on. And then you're saying, if I get in trouble for this, you'll throw me under the bus and come forward like a savior to these two who you're telling me to attack and punish me. And you know, when you're in his cult, you don't question him. You know better than that. Because if in that moment I had said, wait a minute, that's hypocritical. How can you tell me to attack them and then punish me if there's a controversy created by my attack? So instead, what I said was, would you actually punish me for following your instruction? And he just laughed it off and said, no, 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 don't worry, nothing doing. I won't actually punish you. But these fellows will feel indebted towards me for standing up to defend them against you. And so he would create dramas like that so that he could come forward and stand in the place like a savior. Another way he would do this to manipulate disciples was that he would send people like Ma Pranapriya or Manyanatma or Ranjita, who is basically his Jilin Maxwell. He would send the people within his organization who were like the enforcers there to yell at other disciples. And then when those disciples complained to him saying, she yelled at me, she called me a bitch, she called me a fraud, she told me to kill myself, which he told them to tell those people, he would apologize and say, I'm so sorry she said that to you, dear. She had no right. I'll deal with her. How dare she talk to you like that? But meanwhile, it was his instruction that these ladies followed when they yelled at the person who would then complain about them. And so he would maintain this kind of hidden agenda where people loved him because they thought he defends them when these other people in the cult yell at them, not knowing he told them to yell at them. And he told them, don't tell this person that I gave you this instruction. Yell at them, but make them think you're the one yelling. And so he would come between people like that. He would destroy relationships. He would say on stage that in Hinduism, no marriage can be broken because the marriage vows are too sacred. But behind the scenes, he would sexually seduce the wives behind the backs of the husbands and tell people to get a divorce and take vows of obedience to him. And so he was constantly, constantly being hypocritical, saying one thing on stage, doing something else behind the scenes. I could go on and on, but Satya is just the beginning. Next, let's talk about Aparigraha which means renunciation or living with a minimum number of possessions. Nityananda would constantly tell us aparigraha is freedom, that if you have a ton of possessions, they hold you back, they hold you down, you're constantly maintaining them and taking care of them, and therefore you, know ha you have no freedom in your inner space to seek enlightenment. He made us believe that luxury was a disease. For example, when it got really, really cold in his audinum because there was no heating in any of the rooms or in the dorms, he would tell us a true sannyasi can regulate their body temperature to overcome discomfort in extremes. 
If it's too cold out, you should be able to make yourself warm. If it's too hot out, you should be able to cool your system through pranayama, through yogic breathing. And we all fell for that. He would tell us that if you have jewelry or too many clothes or too many physical objects, or too much money, too much property, it's going to hold you back. And so he would encourage people to literally donate everything they have to him. He has made many requests for his disciples to send him all their gold, to sign over their property deeds to him, to give him all their money. And people do it, not only thinking that, you know, they're giving to a good cause, but also believing that it's going to be beneficial to them. And what's really sad is that when these people do eventually wake up from the brainwashing, they're left with nothing. So if you take sannyas, if you go to him, renounce everything, sign over your property, sign over your bank account, donate all of your family heirlooms, and then eventually you wake up and want to leave, you've got nothing to go back to. Sometimes they've burned their bridges, they've renounced their family, they've quit their jobs he leaves people with no plan B and no options. And meanwhile, while everybody else is renouncing their luxuries, he's living like a king behind the scenes. So I'll never forget going to his room for the first time. It was called A10 in a building in the cult that he called his palace. And the moment I walked in, it smelled sweet because of all the essential oils and aromatherapy he was using. It was as cool as a refrigerator, even though the rest of the audinum was unbearably hot because he had his air conditioning that nobody else had. He had a big king size bed with all the fancy like high thread count cotton sheets that nobody else had access to. We were sleeping on packing foam, not even real mattresses like plastic packing foam with dirty, disgusting, bed bug ridden sheets in an overcrowded dorm with no hot water, sweltering away, thinking that there was something wrong with us because if we were real sannyasis, we'd be able to regulate our body temperature. And meanwhile, the fraud who claimed to be living the highest dharma, who claimed to be a sannyasi, was living in luxury. And I mean, he used to try to sway people into believing that he did this for our benefit, which is where it gets really warped. And which is why a lot of people didn't pick up on these kinds of red flags. You know, he would sit on his golden throne on the stage draped in jewelry. And then he would say things to try to appease those who questioned it. Like, I wear all of this for your benefit. My disciples beg me, please, Swamiji, dress like Shiva. We see you as Shiva. Dress like that. Fulfill our vision of who you are. And so he would justify his gluttony and his greed for adornment by pretending he's doing it because his disciples are begging him to do it. But meanwhile, it was his desire to have a larger-than-life appearance that sparked his enthusiasm and his greed for jewelry. You know, he would tell us that the moment he leaves the stage, he just throws off all the jewelry and lives like a simple village boy, but it's not true. He would keep the jewelry displayed in his room so that he can look at his riches. I remember when a lady named Sumati gave him a gold mala in Varanasi in 2015, he wore it backstage like he would tell all of us he throws off his jewelry the moment he leaves the throne bullshit he he was holding that mala he looked like a little kid on christmas morning who got a gift and he was act, asking ranjita like find out mom make sure this is real gold is it really gold it's heavy nah he was like all excited to have real gold and again that was a red flag for me i remember thinking you know if he's really living aparigraha, if he's really not impressed by material wealth and material riches, why is he so excited that Sumati gave him real gold? And this is something that has only become more and more and more obvious as the years have gone on, where he's become more demanding. Uh, back in, I think, 2020, he actually issued a statement to his followers that said, 
anybody who sends him real gold, like their family heirlooms, their riches, send him their gold and he will wear it. And through wearing it, he will connect with them and bless them. And it was like a huge drive. It's almost like those scam infomercials that say cash for gold, only it's not even cash for gold. It's like blessings for gold. And the blessings are coming from him, who is a total fraud, just criminally manipulating people into giving him everything they have. It's like he makes everybody else live a life of renunciation while he hoards all the profits and lives in luxury. And I mean, even now, he fled India to escape a rape case, but I have heard firsthand from people who have seen him in his hideouts that he demands even now, even now, he demands luxury. I remember before I ever went public and spoke out, somebody who had escaped from Ecuador had told me that he was staying in a place with a gorgeous view, he had multiple rooms, he had all of his stuff with him, he had big screen TVs, he was enjoying everything anybody in the material world would want to enjoy, but still claiming to be a sannyasi. And this is while he's trafficking his disciples in squalor, not giving them access to enough food to eat or, you know, stuff to clean themselves with or even clean underwear. And he's living a life of luxury, even while on the run from the law. I mean, again, talk about like satya, truthfulness. If he was living a transparent life, if he was actually honest, he wouldn't be afraid of a rape conviction. He wouldn't have fled India. And if he was really living the life of a sannyasi, he wouldn't need people like my friend Lainey to carry his treasures in her luggage and drop everything she owned in order to fulfill his greed. If you didn't already see my interview with Lainey, check it out. It's also on my YouTube channel. And she described when she had to clean up the mess he left in Ecuador, she was told before flying to Trinidad, don't bring your own luggage, bring this suitcase with his items. You're not allowed to look in it. You're not allowed to ask what it is, but you have to carry it for him, which to me sounds like the plot to an episode of Locked Up Abroad or like, I didn't know I was a smuggler. It's really scary. But this is what he does when he travels. He has to have all his luxury items with him. And it's a big headache for everybody involved because they have to give up even more of the basic necessities they renounced in order to serve him. All the while, he's conning and fooling the public into believing he's a renunciant. It's just so sick. Um, Astea, non-stealing. Nityananda, if you didn't already know, has been at the heart of many land grab cases in India. And what happens, like for example, in one of them, in Trishulam Adinam, which is out near Chennai, he had been donated the ancestral land of one of his disciples, whose relatives were also named on the land deed, but they contested that donation. So for just imagine for a second, imagine your grandfather had a beautiful estate. And in his will, he left it to all of his sons and daughters and grandchildren. Then imagine one of those grandchildren gets sucked up and brainwashed into a cult. And without the permission of everyone else who owns that land, she donates it to her guru. Now, Nithi, instead of, you know, asking permission from the other relatives who were named on these deeds, and I say deeds plural because this happens multiple times, he instead sends a team of rowdies from his organization to squat on that land and to create a fight between those who are also claiming the right to their ancestral property. So, I mean, the stories in India are all over the media. Like if you look up Nityananda and the land grabs, he has done this not only to properties donated by disciples who he has tricked, 
but he's also done this with temple lands, with properties owned by other smaller audinums. He's kind of set himself up with the claim that if people give land to him, he will use it to build temples and to build schools and to build free hospitals for the public. Like, it sounds so generous, but what he's really trying to do is line his own pockets because he understands that land and gold have an appreciative value and he wants to be as wealthy as possible, just like any typical narcissist. So he claims to be living Astea. He'll tell all of his disciples how wrong it is to steal, but behind their backs, he is a thief. He is stealing land, he is stealing gold, he is stealing property, he's even stealing people's minds. Nobody goes to him and is told on day one, his goal is to have all your money. He wants to destroy all of your relationships with your friends and family because he doesn't want you to have any influence in your life outside of his instruction. He is going to use you to smuggle stuff across borders in South America, whether you know what you're smuggling or not. If anybody was told going in, what he's actually going to do with their lives once they surrender, he would be a single malignant narcissist sitting by himself wishing he had followers. But because he has learned to strategically, cunningly lie to people, win them over, and then slowly brainwash them into compliance, he's getting away with this. And I hope not for long, like I really do hope the authorities will step up their game and that Interpol will launch a proper red corner investigation to find him and send him back to India to face the thunder because he has committed enough crimes that like Keith Raniere, he should be in prison forever with no chance of parole. And so should Ranjita, so should his other accomplices. Okay, we'll leave Astea for now and get to Ahimsa. Ahimsa is, for me, the most sacred of all the five vows of sannyas because Ahimsa means non-violence. As a lifelong lover of animals and a lifelong compassionate person who really hates to see anybody suffer, I was drawn to Sanatana Dharma because to me, it seems to be one of the very few world religions or lifestyles, because I understand Sanatana Dharma is more than just a religion, but to me, it's one of the very few that actually honors nonviolence, that actually promotes vegetarianism and compassion. One of the things I found problematic about the Christian Bible growing up Catholic was that God had ordered animal sacrifices and had condoned eating meat and had instructed for, you know, murder and crap like that. And I just, I just can't get behind it. So I was really drawn to the concept of Ahimsa. And back in the olden days of like 2006, seven, eight, nine, the fraud who calls himself Nityananda used to claim to be living a life of Ahimsa. Now, I know for a fact he's not really nonviolent. One of the ladies I interviewed early on in my whistleblowing is named Joanna Lasoka. So hi, Joanna, and thank you for helping speak out about this. In my interview with her, she described an incident in which she was sitting in the temple in Nityananda's ashram, and she physically saw him beat somebody not order somebody else to beat somebody, but he himself beat somebody. There's also a French Canadian man named Henri Jalicoeur who has come forward about a time when he questioned Nityananda in Tiruvannamalai and Nityananda instructed disciples to beat Henry. He actually got physically attacked on Nityananda's instruction. There's also a really lovely man, a very very cool guy, I have to say, named Haran Singham, who I interviewed. And I say he's a really cool guy because he's a life coach. He helps people overcome the kind of traumas he endured in his early life growing up in Sri Lanka during wartime. Well, he was there in Nityananda's cult, 
And because he's now Australian, the fraud didn't know that he speaks Tamil. And Haran described in my interview with him that there was an incident in which he was sitting in Nityananda's courtyard. And at that time, there was an elderly couple who are Ayurvedic doctors who had been brought in. I'm trying to say this without laughing, but they had been brought in to help the fraud lose weight. And so they had prescribed a special diet and exercise plan for him. And it wasn't working because he wasn't following it. He was eating whatever he wanted. He wasn't exercising. In those days, he was morbidly obese. And if you don't believe me, just Google pictures of him from the 2006, 2000, sorry, 2016, 2017 era. He was enormous. And Haran overheard Nityananda ask the elderly man of this couple, why isn't it working? And the man told him that he has to stop drinking coffee. And of course, the way Nitti took his coffee was with tons of whole fat milk and tons of sugar. And obviously, you're not going to lose weight if you're drinking a lot of fat and sugar. A lot of calories, too many calories. I mean, everybody knows that. Diet and exercise, you know, calorie deficit to lose weight. So Nitti said he's not willing to give up coffee. Haran overheard Nitti instruct some of his disciples, ask him what else I can do instead. And the doctor said, if he's not willing to get up coffee, he's going to be fat. And the doctor said this plain and simple. And then Nitti Ananda overheard that and instructed his disciples to kick them out of the ashram, but first beat them, beat them, beat up an old man and an old lady who had come to help him because he didn't like that he had to do something in order to achieve the benefit they recommended. And so this poor elderly couple went there as doctors to help him lose weight, and then they got beaten up because he wasn't able to follow their advice. And these are just the things that Nitti has done to grown-ups. You know, what really broke my heart was when I found out that on December 31st of 2017, all of the kids in his residential school called a Gurukul were brutalized, were beaten on his instruction. When I first spoke out about this publicly, the cult of Nityananda attacked me. They falsely accused me of rape. They falsely accused me of an assassination attempt against the guru. They falsely accused me of being a Catholic missionary trying to you know, destroy Hinduism. They accused me of all kinds of crap, but they never once answered to the allegation of child abuse. And unfortunately, their character assassinations against me caused a lot of the parents of Gurukul kids not to believe it because he told all of these poor kids who had been traumatized through his violence that if they told their parents what happened to them, that would be considered Guru Droha or a sin against the Guru, which according to Nityananda is the only unforgivable sin that exists. If you murder for him, that's fine. If you commit suicide for him, great. Thank you for your sacrifice. If you steal for him, thank you for the donation. But if you question him, you are cursed for all eternity. And this is something that you'll see in any malignant narcissist. They will justify any crime if it serves their agenda, but they will be completely unforgiving of anybody going against them. And so a lot of the parents ignored my warnings, didn't believe it, until a very brave man named Janardana Sharma, who I believe is really a hero, went public when the cult kidnapped his daughter Nandita and trafficked both of his young adult daughters, Nandita and her sister Lopa Mudra, first to Ecuador, then to Trinidad, and now they're in Jamaica, being used and abused by the cult. But he spoke out about the atrocities this cult has done to the Gurukul kids and his third daughter Kalpalata very bravely opened up publicly and confirmed 
everything I said about the Gurukul beatings and more. So I shared about the beatings on December 31st, but Kalpalata and her younger brother opened up about other horrific incidences that have happened. And I've heard from many Gurukul kids behind the scenes who are too scared to go public because they still have parents who are involved in the cult or they don't feel safe because they know the cult will attack them if they speak out. But I've heard many kids corroborating the story that was first told to me, adding even more details to it. And I've also heard from adult insiders from within the cult that Ma Advait has admitted to all of this. She admitted this to the heads of the Houston temple, for example, who pulled their daughter out of the cult, but still promote the organization. So there's a lot of hypocrisy that goes on a lot of parents are enabling this abuse to be committed against other people's kids while keeping their own kids away because now they know what's happening. And the other thing is, violent attacks against the kids are only one aspect of the child abuse going on. There's also sleep deprivation. There's also mental manipulation. These kids are being used as pawns to draw other people into the organization. They're being put on stage and dressed up as gods and goddesses, while behind the scenes, they are being criticized for not doing enough. The reason they were ordered to brutalize each other on the morning of December 31st of 2017 is that Nityananda was blaming them for the fact that program participants were not experiencing powers of the third eye. Another example of his lies, an example of how he is not living the true dharma of satya. He told program participants, come, you don't have to do anything. Through my touch alone, you will be able to read blindfolded and move objects through telekinesis and see through walls and grow taller, grow shorter, shrink your waist, do whatever. He told them he will give them those powers through his touch. When they didn't manifest these powers because, duh, nobody's touch will make anybody else magical, he blamed it on the kids. And this is where the violent abuse against them becomes even more traumatic and even more deplorable. Before they were forced to beat each other to the point of blood and tears, they were told, this is because you are all frauds. You are not in a space of oneness with your guru, you're letting him down, you're failures. They were told they're supposed to be in a space of Shaktipada or a space of mirror neurons. There was all kinds of crazy sort of physics language being thrown around without proper definitions. Like they were told the participants will mirror their neurons and that when they manifest these powers in the presence of people, people will catch them and do it too. So they were told they have to be beaten because they had failed the people who paid $16,000 for that program. That kind of pressure and guilt and weight should never be put on a child. Nityananda would have people beat each other in ashramite meetings. He would have sannyasis beat other sannyasis. And I also remember there was a day after he gave me a giant silver stick with a lion's face, he told me if any man is ever out of integrity with him, I had the legal right to beat that man with the stick he gave me because according to Indian law, it's not illegal for a woman to beat a man. And so he knew the loopholes of the law. He told Ma Advait, the head of the Gurukul, it's illegal for an adult to beat a child, but it's not illegal for a child to beat other children. And that's why he forced the kids to beat each other. However, I think of the legal precedent, for example, in the Manson murders, when Charles Manson forced his disciples to commit heinous murders, Manson was convicted of murder, 
on the grounds that he used disciples as a weapon. He weaponized his followers and made them commit murder. And I would say likewise, although technically it's not illegal for a kid to beat another kid, Nityananda weaponized children against other children. In effect, he beat them through each other. And so I feel any judge worth his salt, any prosecutor in India who understands this, who understands the way undue influence works and how brainwashing works, can very clearly see that it was literally Nityananda who beat kids because he gave the order that was not questionable that the kids had to beat each other. This is the abuse of power. Anytime there's an authority who is not questionable, who, who establishes themselves above reproach, who creates an infrastructure around them where anybody who questions them gets punished, which we did. If anybody ever questioned him, he would send them to do hard manual labor. He would have other disciples yell at them and chastise them. He would tell everybody else, this person is a cheat. They're trying to destroy me. They've turned anti. He created an environment where his word was the ultimate law. And so when he gave instructions to people to beat other people, by nature of the fact that those people felt they could not say no to his instructions, that means he was the violent one. There are also stories of people abusing animals in his cult that I can't even think of because it would make me cry and I don't want to give him that satisfaction. So I'll move on from Ahimsa to the fifth and final item on our list, Brahmacharya or celibacy, living like a god as he would call it. So this is the one that I think for anybody who is not brainwashed by Nityananda, it's the most obvious of course he's not celibate. We've all seen the very real, not morphed video of Ranjita, the C-list South Indian actress who did kind of pseudo porn. We've all seen the video of her giving him a blowjob that was leaked to Sun TV way back when in February of 2010. Since then, he has abused men, women, and kids. He grooms all the children in his gurukul for sex slavery. They are told that the highest aspiration in life to be is to be a member of his so-called SM team. And the people who are on his SM team are essentially sex slaves. They are available at his beck and call. Whenever he wants a sexual favor, they have to fulfill it. And they're made to believe that this is a sort of spiritual duty, that they are serving the physical body of a god and that it's a beautiful thing for them to do, which is really sick. The way he was able to entrap Arti Rao, the very first rape victim to go public and to lodge a complaint against him, was that he told her that the aspect of devotion that she embodied was Madhura Baba, which is where you feel the guru as a beloved. And what she didn't know is that he had multiple victims to whom he had said the exact same thing. He is not living a life of brahmacharyam. He is not celibate. He is porn addicted. He demands his disciples, not all of them, mind you, like this is why some of them will deny it and sound believable because they don't know he's doing this. Like he'll deliberately keep some people out of the loop so they have plausible deniability and they'll think any victim is making it up or is crazy. But behind the scenes, he is sexting with so many people. If you have a pretty wife or a pretty sister or a pretty daughter who is a follower of Nityananda, or a handsome brother, a handsome husband, a handsome son who is a follower of Nityananda, check their messages, ask them to be transparent. If they are in private communication with their fraud guru, see what kind of stuff he says to them. He requests nude photos, including of children. The youngest kid I've heard this happened to was 15 at the time, but of course, 
it's very, very possible that he was abusing minors even younger than that. He will pick kids at a very young age and start grooming them towards this so that as they get older, they feel that he is God and they have no right to say no to God. I really believe Facebook should be subpoenaed in court against Nithyananda and forced to bring up all the deleted messages from his inbox, the inbox of his personal account, not necessarily the public figure account, which is run by his disciples, but his personal Facebook account is where he love bombed me, where he asked me to send him nude selfies, where he asked a number of my friends who are apprehensive to go public because they've seen the way he utilizes Scientology's fair game policy to attack me. Nobody wants to be on the receiving end of a fake rape accusation or of the kind of horrendous attacks those of us who speak out face. But I guarantee you, I promise you, I would bet money on it and I would make a, make a nice pretty penny if anybody took me up on this bet. I know for a fact if Facebook would open and expose the private inbox, the messages Nithyananda has exchanged and received from disciples, you will find child pornography, you will find just disgusting grooming of people into sex slavery. He is not only not celibate, but he is a sexual predator. He is a rapist. He has raped men, women, and children he is the head of a sex cult. And, you know, I've actually heard people tell me he's almost as bad as Keith Raniere. And I'm telling you, he is as bad as Keith Raniere. And I know how serious that is. I know how messed up the things Keith Raniere did. Nityananda also branded people. This isn't something exclusive to Keith Raniere. He would have things that look kind of like the, the brands that would be used on innocent cows by the beef industry. And he would brand men on the left shoulder and the right shoulder. Now, granted, this is a Vaishnavite Hindu ritual. However, Nityananda would use these brands to claim people as his property. It, he is not a Vaishnavite. He is not of the, the kind of Brahmin caste that has this as an ancestral tradition. And so he'll, he'll appropriate aspects of other Hindu sects and he'll incorporate those into his rituals so that people can't really question it without seeming like they're anti-Hindu or like they are racist. But in reality, he's the one causing damage to the appearance of Hinduism by doing a few things that are pro-Hindu and then a whole bunch of cult bullshit out of the playbook of Scientology and Nexium and muddying the water that way. You know, a great way to manipulate people. And he would literally say this. I'll, I'll try to find which satsang he said this in, but he said, if you give one truth and five lies and people look up the truth and find out it's real, they will believe the five lies that you tell them. So he strategically does a few good things or says a few helpful things or, you know, uses a few genuine Hindu rituals to make people believe that he's authentic. And then when he starts the insidious grooming for sex slavery, people go along with it because, well, he did those good things, so I must not understand his reason for doing that bad thing. And this is how he's gotten away with all of the sex crimes over the years. For every one Arti Rao, there are a hundred raped women who are too scared to speak out. A friend of mine who is one of his male victims did an interview with me once describing how he was abused by Nityananda. For every brave man like him, there are a hundred others who have been put in that same ridiculous, unfathomable position who are too embarrassed or too scared to speak up. And it's very sad that an abuser, like the fraud who calls himself Nityananda, is getting away with this because his victims are the ones who feel ashamed. And this is the way 
Abusers of all kinds get away with their crimes because victims are silenced. When somebody leaves the Nityananda cult, they're forced to sign something called exit papers, which includes a non-disclosure agreement and a waive of their right to sue for any damages done to them during their time in the cult. And they're not given the chance to have these papers reviewed by a lawyer. They're not given the opportunity to reword anything that they don't agree with. They are just badgered and pressured and forced to sign. And so the, the reason other victims don't come forward is that they've been forced to sign an NDA. And one thing I've discovered in my research is that in US law, a non-disclosure agreement is considered reprehensible and not valid if the person who signed was not given the choice not to sign. And so by nature of the fact that people are told you cannot leave if you don't sign these papers and the doors are locked and there are disciples around them ready to drag them back and not let them get in the taxi to flee this heinous environment, by nature of the fact that they are forced to sign these NDAs, the NDAs don't count. And the other thing I dug up in my research about non-disclosure agreements is that they exist to protect intellectual property, such as patents of technology or lists of customers, like databases that could be sensitive so that if a person leaves a company, they cannot feed information to that company's competition. So for example, if you work for a company that is manufacturing some kind of new technology and you leave and they give you an NDA, that means you cannot take their methods for manufacture and go to a rival company and scoop them and say, okay, let's make this before they make it. And that's valid. That makes sense. It's a way a company can protect what it owns. However, if a person is sexually abused, tormented, bullied, treated like shit, beaten up, or if they've witnessed a crime in a company and that company forces them to sign an NDA that protects only the more powerful of the two parties, so it protects the company but not the person who is leaving the company, that NDA is considered not valid because it's not used to serve the purpose for which NDAs were created. It's not being used to protect the corporate property. It's being used to prevent a victim from getting justice. And that is not right. The reason Harvey Weinstein was brought down by the Me Too movement, despite the fact that his victims signed NDAs, is that those NDAs were not considered legally binding by nature of the fact that they were protecting a sex predator at the expense of the victims. And so similarly, if you're seeing this and you signed those exit papers and you felt silenced by them because you've been made to believe you're not allowed to talk about what Nityananda did to you or else you'll be in trouble legally, please, please, please let go of that fear because you were the victim and he was the attacker. And anything that you've signed is not legally binding if it allows a criminal to perpetuate his crimes. So for example, the fact that kids got beaten, if I didn't speak up about that publicly, it would be me enabling him to continue to beat children. The fact that I was sexually preyed upon by him, if I didn't speak up about that, it would be me enabling him to sexually prey on others. When you know somebody has done something wrong and you stay silent about it, you are allowing that person who victimized you to victimize other people. And I don't mean to shame those who choose not to come forward. I know it's hard. I know it sucks when people question you or the cult attacks you or you have to share embarrassing things with people. But I promise you, in the end, just like the world is on the side of Sarah Edmondson, not the monsters who branded her, the way the world is on the side of Leah Remini, not the Scientology goons who are 
you know, trying to destroy her. That same way the world will be on the side of Arti Rao and Lenin Karupan and me and you if you choose to come forward. So Nityananda, he's not only not celibate, he's also a pedophile, a child pornographer, a human trafficker, and a rapist. He's not only not a brahmachari, he's not only not celibate, but he's also the worst, worst, worst kind of sexual offender. He is dangerous, he is abusive, he is manipulative, and he sees people as his property. He sees the kids in his gurukul as belonging to him. He feels entitled to their sexual subservience. He gets a sick thrill out of making a straight guy into his sexual prey. It's kind of like when you hear about Weinstein jerking off in front of an unsuspecting woman who came up to have an audition and suddenly found herself in a casting couch situation. The same way, that same kind of mental illness exists in Nityananda who gets a sick thrill out of making people sexually uncomfortable. It's really seriously wrong. I might get into more detail, not might, I will get into more detail in future videos, but for now, this is why I'm saying, even though he wears the ochre robes and wears the rudrakshas, he might say, I'm just a humble village boy, or he might call himself a sannyasi because he's painted himself in sannyas colors, but he is not, he is a danger to society, he is a danger to his followers, he is a parasite to anybody who falls victim to his lies and his manipulations. He will drain your bank account, he will drain your life force energy, he will drain you of devotion, and if you ever get so lucky as to free yourself, he will make you feel like you are still trapped by making you believe that you don't have the right to speak out. And if you do speak out, he will attack you or he will claim that he's cursing you. But I promise you, as a person who has been cursed by him and attacked by him and character assassinated by him and slandered and accused of all kinds of horrible crimes by him that I didn't commit, I promise you, even after everything he has tried to do to destroy me, my life is pretty awesome. I get to make jewelry like this necklace that I'm wearing or these bracelets that I'm wearing. I get to read tarot cards, which was a passion of mine before I got into the cult. I get to hang out with my family. I have the freedom to go for a walk on a nice day like today. I have the freedom to do anything I feel like doing. And he hasn't stopped me. My health is good. My joy for life is good. My relationships are good. He will never actually succeed in silencing me because his bluffs are empty. All he can do is cry victim and call me an anti-Hindu, but I know that's not true. And similarly, if you choose to speak out against whatever sexual abuse, physical abuse, mental abuse, financial abuse you've experienced from him, your life will only get better for speaking out. It can't get worse. Because one more trap that a lot of cult survivors experience is the trap of feeling like they can't come forward. They have this fear or this anxiety attached to what will people think? if he falsely accuses them of something, or what will people think if they know that they did this thing? But I really applaud Nexium whistleblowers and Scientology whistleblowers, and especially the experts of psychology who have supported them, the therapists who specialize in mind control and cult abuse, like Dr. Yanya Lalik, like Rachel Bernstein, like Dr. Stephen Hassan, because when these experts explain the systematic way in which a cult will control somebody's mind, it makes it very clear that the victims should never be blamed or shamed for what was done to them. And I would say, I'll end the video on this. If you have been abused by the fraud who calls himself Nityananda, and you're feeling guilty because you didn't see the red flags or didn't listen to your intuition or quote unquote allowed 
the abuse to happen to you. The same way we would never shame the victim of a mugging for getting robbed, you should never be shamed, even by yourself, for what happened to you. You were spiritually mugged by a spiritual con artist. You went there believing that he lives ahimsa. You never thought you would be brought into a violent organization or ordered to beat somebody or instructed to ignore suffering. You thought you were going to a good nonviolent place and it's not your fault that you were conned. It was an easy lie to believe. It's not your fault that you donated a ton of money to a criminal who is using that money to evade the law because you were told the money will go to building a school or a temple or a hospital. It's not your fault that you donated money that is now being used to harbor a fugitive. It's not your fault if you were sexually abused by somebody who claimed to be celibate. I know many people who were called into Nityananda's bedroom and told, you are blessed, you get to press his feet, which is something that disciples long to do for their guru which is what we were told, because in the Sri Guru Gita, it says the Guru's feet is what anchors the higher wisdom on planet Earth. And if you massage his feet, then you become filled with that wisdom. And while this may have archaically been true in a previous yuga, like the Satya Yuga, when gurus, you know, if it was real, if, if those gurus of the past really did anchor a higher light, that's what the scripture was referring to. It's no longer a blessing to press the rapist abusive feet of a fraud. But if you were called into his bedroom and told that you're there to press his feet and he then molested you, it is not your fault. You didn't let that happen to yourself. You were blindsided by him. And that is not your bad. That is fucking his bad. That is his bad. And it is so bad that I believe he, like Keith Raniere, will eventually find himself in prison for consecutive life sentences without parole, the end. And I hope that when he is in prison, the other prisoners know that he raped kids and sexually groomed young children and swindled lots of people and abused the devotion of innocent seekers. I hope the other prisoners treat him the same way they would treat any other rapist. And from what I hear, that's about as nicely as the fraud who calls himself Nityananda treats his disciples. Thank you for watching. If you have any questions about other things related to that sinister cult I've chosen to expose, please let me know in the comments below. If you are a victim of that fraud, please seek professional help if you still feel unresolved about it or damaged. And if you're a victim of the fraud who calls himself Nityananda and you want to go public and maybe you want to give me an interview like some of the other victims have done, please let me know. Please reach out. I would be more than happy to open this platform to you so that you can get some closure, share your story and possibly save others from experiencing that same abuse that unfortunately you have experienced. Thank you so much for watching. We'll see you in the next video. Bye for now.